Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a series that aims to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will help you understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today is a special guest. I've known him for many years, haven't seen him for a while. He and his wife, Maureen, have been very involved in a number of different things. Ted's resume is so long that I'm going to do it injustice by cutting some of it out, but just a few things. Uh, in 1984, he and his wife, Maureen, founded a crisis pregnancy center. They've helped counsel over thousands of young men and women on the evils of abortion. They've done sign of the times that's been informing people through articles on uh, messages in the faith. Uh, they started the International Week of Prayer and Fasting. That's been going on almost 30 years. Um, he's the author of numerous books. Uh, the Thunder of Justice was well known. Book on um, the major apparitions of the Blessed Mother. That was back in 93. In 2000, Hope of the Wicked, the Master Plan to Rule the World. 2002, one of my favorites was Idols in the House. So well documented. You can just read these books and just see he's done his homework. Um, we're going to talk today about one of his books, Diabolical Disorientation. The Roots of the Crisis in the Church, Family, Nation, and Culture. And you can get that book at their website, sign, S-I-G-N dot org. Just a little bit more about Ted. He's been involved in real estate development. He's traveled all over the world, been to more than 50 countries, lived in Poland and Belarus for a couple of years. We're going to talk about that, what he saw there. Uh, just an incredibly brilliant man. And... Uh, I've got some questions for him because, frankly, I got a lot of questions myself about what's going on in the world today, and I'm hoping he can sort it out for me and you. But um, welcome to Mercy Unbound, Ted. It's great to see you. Well, thank you. I always enjoy you and especially the things you're doing to inform people. Ted, this book, Diabolical Disorientation, interesting title. Uh, how did this book come about? Well, it was actually a process. Um, I realized many years ago that books were, were dying off a little bit due to the social media and all of the avenues to get a set of eyeballs on something and all of the competition. And, you know, I really enjoy the writing process. But what I started for our website, which is called Signs of the Times, was doing shorter articles and beginning to inform people on what I thought heaven's perspective was on a lot of very, very important issues. And uh, I originally started out with something that was called Letters to Sardis. And if you look at the uh, chapter uh, two and three of the book of Revelation, there are seven churches in, in, in Revelation that are contemporaneous spirits. You get Thyatira, Ephesus, Pergamos, Philadelphia, Laodicea, uh, Sardis and Smyrna, you've got those seven churches. And the church, the Lord has something very, very interesting to say and encouraging about every single one of them. And the only one he has nothing negative to say is about the church of Philadelphia, because that's the church of love. But to the church of Sardis, he said, strengthen those that remain. And I started writing for the remnant to kind of keep them in the fences because uh, they were getting so disheartened. And so that's, it started out with, you know, two and a half to up to four pages for the internet because it can't be long. And so that's how it started out. And a lot of the people like the articles. So about a year and a half ago, I put it in, in a book because I've done somewhere near 90 total. So I put some of the best articles in the book. It's the, uh, term, the term that's very important, diabolical disorientation. I remember the first time I, ever, I, I heard that, that phrase for the first time in the mid 80s, and it always stuck with me. Uh, I think it was 1975. It was a, April 12th. I'm forgetting right now. I remember April 12th. I'm forgetting the year right now. But Sister Lucy of Fatima said the world would go through a period of diabolical disorientation. And the final attack would be on marriage and the family. And oh boy, oh boy, I mean, just take a look at what's happening. You want to talk transgender, critical race theory, 
pick a subject in there in marriage and divorce and infidelity. I mean, nothing have we seen an assault like there is on marriage and the family like we've seen just in the last, you know, X number of years. You know, a lot of words floating around today, of course, uh, in the politics in America, socialism, you even got the word communism floating around. You wrote a lot of articles in the book on socialism and communism. Why an emphasis on those two? Well, I've had a fascination, whether it's genetic or an acquired taste, I'm not quite sure. But um, from a very young age, I've just had an interest on the etiology or in essence, the evolution or the philology, which is the, the origin of language and, and how it's used. I've had an interest in how people become who they are. And because I've, I've traveled a lot in my life, you can see how different cultures are affected. In other words, something happens at some time to where they become who they are today. In the United States, we are who we are today in our philosophy and our thinking because of things that happened many, many years ago. For instance, you can't take, you can't understand the United States spiritual state until you take a look at the Supreme Court in 1962 and in 1963, taking prayer and the Bible out of the classroom where it was never even allowed in many places where there would be lawsuits if you even let a Bible in the classroom. So we arrived at this point through very, very specific things. And if you want to even take a look at a country like Germany, where you had uh, George Hegel, who was born in 1840, and he, he bred the, um, the ideal of the German citizen, which became the Aryan concept of purity of race. And, and children were fed for generations a very, very healthy dose of that because Gehog or George Hegel was, was one of their, their giants intellectually. And then another intellectual giant, which it would not be my disposition or view or yours, would be Frederick Nietzsche, who was the, as an atheist, was the Antichrist. So in, uh, the concept of what an antichrist figure is. So in other words, Germany evolved to the Third Reich and who they were with the, a fascist state under Hitler because they had had decades and decades of philosophy and youth of an antichrist with an Aryan concept of a super race, which was the Aryan. And if you weren't that, you, you, you weren't uh, an equal citizen in Germany, which we saw through the Jewish issue, issue. So we evolve into this thing in communism, in socialism, which I think you're, you're talking about of how we evolve into different things. Communism is just socialism in a hurry is what it is. Now, I happened to, in graduate school, went to the London School of Economics, which when I got over there, I didn't really understand it. I, I had radical economics in London. It made Berkeley look like it was Wheaton College in Illinois. I mean, you know, you're talking about the Fabian concept of, of hardcore socialism, which is a very British thing. And the, the symbol uh, for the London School of Economics was a turtle. And everybody knows the turtle won the race against the rabbit. And in Surrey, England, which is the headquarters for the Fabian Society, the stained glass window is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Hmm. That's, in other words, they have agendas. We don't end up like we are today until there had been many, many previous concepts, thoughts, and philosophies of how nations end up. And at the moment, the United States and the West is very, very lost. Now, Ted, you mentioned the turtle. Isn't that one of the comments kind of that uh, Gorbachev made as to why Russia fell, the communism rate versus the socialism speed? Well, you, it, it, it sounds like you've read some of the book to even ask that question. So that's a good one. And, and this is almost the heart of how we ended up where we are. This is the beating heart of it all. 
Uh, I, I get into great lengths at different times uh, around this subject in different articles because it's so prescient and so significant an issue. Uh, there was a man by the name of Antonio Gramsci, which you mentioned idols in the house. I wrote about him all the way back then in 2002, as well as all the way through a, a theme that I've never let go of. But Antonio Gramsci was a co-founder of the Italian Communist Party in Italy. And in 1922, he decided he wanted to go to Moscow, Russia, to experience what was happening in the revolution. And so to fast forward here and give you the bottom line, Gramsci in Russia decided very, very early that communism wouldn't work the way the ideal of Leninism, um, the whole concept of the Bolshevik Leninism would work. And the reason was it was too violent. And a lot of people can see that through the movie, Dr. Zhivago of how violent it was early on with an overthrow of in essence, the monarchy. And so what you had is when, when, when Gramsci felt it was too violent, principally because the Russian soul was a Christian soul and you could not eradicate the thousand years of Kiev Rus, which was 888, all of the way through 1988 is a thousand years, the trade route of Kiev all the way to Russia. And so, um, and Gorbachev talked about that in the year 1988. So when he came back, Mussolini feared Antonio Gramsci. For your readers, if you want to read it, it's G-R-A-M-S-C-I. I think Gramsci was the greatest political genius and, and theoretical genius than literally Machiavelli himself, who's considered the, the modern uh, godfather, so to speak, of political science, because he kind of codified a lot of his thinking, especially in his book, The Prince, of what you had to do to take over. And so uh, Mussolini feared him, so he threw, he threw Gramsci in jail. And, it, when, and he was a relatively young man. And what he did, he started something called prison notebooks. And here, this is the genius. Here's what he did. He said, the way to change a culture is gradually do it a little bit at a time. In other words, plant your people in there in academia, in media, or, or political thought or corporations or an especially government in key positions. And this is how you can effectuate change. And even people like Bella Dodd spoke about how they accomplished that by infecting seminaries to where they said one liberal, by the way, they use the word liberal and progressive. You never use the word socialist or communist. They said the way to take it over is use liberal or progressive, but you can't be truthful. So they infiltrated these entities, organizations, government, et cetera, by planting their people in and say whatever is necessary to further your cause. One step, one step forward, three steps forward, two back, but keep moving the ball upfield, whatever it takes. And so this is how they've changed our culture. And something that happened when uh, after perestroika glasnost of the Soviet Union, 19, really 92 to 94, where it kind of fell without any great degree of, of violence compared to the Bolshevik revolution or French revolution or the Spanish civil war or whatever, um, they decided the best thing to do was just continue to go incrementally. So Gramsci codified a plan to how to infiltrate slowly and take over. And at the Presidio in San Francisco after the fall of the Soviet Union, when Gorbachev left, he became a fellow uh, in, in, in the United States and was speaking all around, if you remember way, way back. He would speak and he, and he spoke a lot about this after the thousand year reign of Kiev Rus. 
And he literally would say, had we followed the principles of Antonio Gramsci, we would have accomplished our cause and we would have been more effective and we would have done more conclusively rather than had even the Soviet Union morphed into the state of what, what I think is the perceived many is the perceived collapse of the United of, of the USSR. Now you hear a name thrown around today a lot and most people I would venture would say I, I've heard a name but I don't know who he was and is even a real person Saul Alinsky. Didn't he follow uh, Gramsci's concepts really and aren't the, isn't this stuff all going on today? Well, you know, uh, Alinsky um, was an absolute lost radical. He had, I think, gone to the University of Chicago and he became a an, an, uh, community organizer, exactly like Barack Obama followed. But you have people like Hillary Clinton and Obama who actually followed the principles and even wrote term papers and thesis on in Gramsci all of the way through Alinsky. But Alinsky then, he had an original book which was called Revelry for Radicals. And Revelry for Radicals was his first thought process on paper of how to take over systems from within using the principles of Antonio Gramsci. And so what, what uh, Alinsky did, he formed the Open Society and he always put it in a concept of social justice to appeal to the concept of social justice. But he was an atheist. He didn't want anything to do with God in the equation, nor did Gramsci. And so Open Society was the name of his organization. And people may know that's exactly what George Soros is, the name of his organization is. So where Alinsky left off, um, uh, Soros picked up with the exact same name, which is Media Matters, which I think uh, Soros has something like 200 organization to overthrow the culture from within using the principles of Gramsci, but much more aggressively with Alinsky. And Alinsky in, in, in the 1960s went over to meet with uh, Pope Paul VI to talk about the Catholic campaign for human development under the guise of quote, social justice, fairness, and all of that. And uh, uh, Pope Paul VI fell for it, but again, Alinsky had a different agenda to take anything out of spirituality. And anybody who's read his second book called Rules for Radicals, which is the one everybody really knows, and it became very famous when Hillary was running because she was such a fan of Alinsky. He was very much talking about getting in an organization, having your agenda, doing what you want, and then when you're put in a position of authority and leadership, begin to bring your people over, quote, with your liberal or progressive. But, you know, they go to class on this material. We didn't end up here by mistake. These people are political geniuses and they're long-term thinkers to where a lot of the conservative body, if you begin to speak about this material, you can begin to be labeled a conspiracy theorist and that's the way the discount, they discount you. This isn't theory anymore. Take a look what's going on. They have achieved a lot of their goals by by what I call numbing down to dumb down. We're here with our youth and everything else because they have been very, very effective in generational thinking and not giving up. And even Fulton Sheen would speak about how much more um, enthusiastic the left is than the right. And Saul Alinsky in his book, for anybody who's, who's ever seen it, in his introduction or prologue, he literally dedicates the book to Satan, the first great rebel. It's right there, right in, it's a very short introduction, uh, a prologue, whatever. Satan, the first great rebel, and his goal was to organize the people in hell. You know, Ted, when I think of 
since the current president was elected and things seem to have just gone downhill so fast, but then listening to you, it makes me think this has been like a slow boil for many years. You know, if you throw a lobster in boiling water, he screams and screeches, but if it's a slow boil, he'll sit in there and feel comfortable until he's boiled. And that's almost what's happening in our society. Am I, am I reading that right? Well, actually, boy, uh, uh, you've got the concept right, but the lobsters don't scream. <laughs> you know, they, I'm they, from Florida, they're not. So forgive me. Well, it's actually. Well, I'm from New England, and I used to have lobster pots in Rhode Island, and so um, the. Uh, but the point is, is that's even more appropriate unintentionally for what you were just saying. The lobster is silent, just like a lot of the, the Christian, uh, or conservative population. We have been taken advantage of, and the mistake of of the conservatives, or whether you want you want to, you know, because I don't believe, uh, or I believe at the very very top of the Republican and the Democratic Party, the, there's corruption right at the very top of all of them. So I don't think anyone is more pure than the rest. At the very top, they just wash each other's back, and after being in Washington now, every administration since Nixon. I can tell you that's exactly what I've seen because these are the people that move in and out of my neighborhoods with different administrations. There really isn't a different, it's what can I take once they get in government? And that's why one of the main reasons government doesn't work. But this, is, this has been a generational coup d'etat. And what we're looking at right now is, is because of Twitter and all of the social media, in Facebook, with in Google, we're looking at a digital coup d'état of the entire country. This is going downhill very, very, very fast now. I mean, you know, uh, at least when Rome fell, at least the roads were all good roads. You know, um, I get confused by a lot of these terms: uh, fascism, and we got socialism which everybody thinks is okay, a good chunk of people do. And then you got the communism, you got, of course, Maoism and Marxism. And sort this out for me a little bit, if you would. Well, how about if I just hit the highlights? Because th th that'd take us maybe into tomorrow afternoon to answer the way that I think would be appropriate. But let's just hit the highlights. You've got a lot of isms. They all in political philosophy mean something a little different. And that's a big part of diabolical disorientation. Now, I've, I've, uh, I spent two years uh, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I had an office and an apartment in Warsaw, Poland. So I had seen literally the Berlin Wall fell in November of 89. And I had an apartment there February 1 doing things for the World Bank. And so I was there two years, and then I ended up in Belarus for two years, um, right above Chernobyl, actually. I spent most of my time in Minsk above, and, and above Chernobyl in, a, in an oblast, which is their word for, for county, uh, above in a town called Gomel. Now, communism doesn't necessarily, as a political philosophy, need to be violent. But it usually is, and the principal reason is they have to get rid of the Christian population. And here's what I found most appropriate that I saw over there and more, most poignant, is that whenever the communists take over anything, their goal is to get rid of all of the religious symbols and the symbols of history. And we've seen that with the tearing down of a lot of monuments, whether it's Robert E. Lee in Richmond, the big statue right downtown. Now, nobody, nobody would, would agree that slavery was right. But the point is, that is the nation's history. And it's who we are. And all of the churches in the former Soviet Union, they ended up becoming granaries, liquor stores, storage facilities, retail stores, boutiques, a lot of them were very pretty with stained glass, apartment buildings or whatever, or places to live. So they had to strip the culture of all of religion. Uh, faith cannot coexist in any communist culture. Why? 
because it's an issue of the state being primary. It's all about the state. And so the saying is, is that uh, communism is socialism in a hurry. Socialism by its design of the turtle is bit by bit, increment by increment taking over to achieve the goal. Now, if you take a look at Leninism, Leninism with the, with the uh, fall of during in the Soviet Union of 11 time zones from Vladivostok all the way to St. Petersburg by Finland, that was a very, very violent revolution. And what I found was interesting is that the Communist Party at that time only had 15,000 people that overtook the nation. Why? Think of it, 11 time zones, that's from where we are right now on the East Coast to West Australia, 11 time zones. But because they're aggressive and the, and the Christian population is, tends to be more docile because they, they, they don't believe they're, quote, being Christian if they speak up. We are where we are as a culture in the United States because the Christian population has not spoken up. We are specifically here because we've left, let the left take over. So then you could have uh, communism under, under Mao Zedong or Chairman Mao with the Great March, where approximately 50 million people were murdered by Mao. So did, did Mao start with socialism? Absolutely not. So there is, there is a nuance there in all of these isms. So Mao just came in and killed everybody in the same way Stalinism, when he wanted to get rid of the issues with the Ukrainians, what he did was just starve them to death. And history seems to be, and I spent quite a bit of time in the Ukraine and Belarus, and the Ukrainians are not overly fond of the Russians as we know, to this very day. And so Russia has always used the threat that will freeze them to death with that Russian winter and Ukrainian winter and not give them natural gas unless they stay compliant. So it's all by force. And then you've got fascism, which is more like a, 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 a Stalinism versus a, a Nazi type to where everything is at the point of a gun. Yet Mao Zedong was like that. And as I said, history isn't clear on exactly how many Stalin murdered. Some say 30, some say 50 million. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, and this, and what do they've got? What do they have to do first? They have to eradicate Christianity, close the churches. And you can see that happening all over Europe. You can see churches being closed in the United States. You can see that the eradication of Christianity from from law in the in, in in schools and everything else yet it's okay to have a a muslim holiday but god forbid if you allow easter in the in, in you can have an easter bunny but nothing to do with jesus christ we're here because we remain docile and silent when you know the church militant is a very very laudatory thought. It's not like you have to be in somebody's face. You know, the truth if spoken by one is still a truth. Jesus spoke very, very gently and truthfully. And everybody can talk about him just in the temple, busting up the furniture. But that took place one time. And, you know, uh, in my father's house is a den of thieves. So these isms do mean different things in different cultures. Where we're headed in the direction now, are we looking at something like Germany was in the 30s? And you mentioned a name in the book, uh, Hannah Arendt. Uh, who was who she? Hannah Arendt is, is something uh, I came across, somebody sent me an article um, met, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, that I had known the book previously, but it was even more poignant today than when I wrote about it a long time ago. Hannah Arendt was a secular Jew from Germany. And in the 1930s, she saw what was coming much before Kristallnacht, 
which only lasted two days, November 18th or 19th, I, where they, you know, the night of the broken glass. And when the Jews saw that it wasn't gonna be pleasant to stay there, she went from Czechoslovakia to Paris to New York. And uh, she became a political theorist. She's actually on the net if you wanna Google her. It's A-R-E-N-D-T, Hannah Arendt, A-R-E-N-D-T. It's really worth looking at that. And so what she did is uh, when Adolf Eichmann was captured um, in Argentina, um, he was captured and brought back to, by Mossad to uh, Jerusalem for trial. She wanted to go over and see the trial because as she said, she needed to understand this evil. How could this happen? And so she went to the trial and, and she wrote a book on it called Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, I guess it was written right in the mid 1960s. And the rest of the title is The Banality of Evil. And Hannah Arendt, as a secular Jew, a lot like an Ayn Rand, who was a Russian Jew, who uh, Atlas Shrugged, the Fountainhead, the Virtue of Selfishness. And um, they're very, very good at pinpointing where the cultural, cultural spirit is. And some of the great writers can do that, like Will Durant and some of the great philosophers, G.K. Chesterton could do it. But the thing that Arendt missed is the concept when there is a lack of faith, this is what happens. But in the, in the, in the classroom, what happened, uh, or not in, in the courtroom, she ended up uh, coming to a conclusion, not that many people thought she would have. What she found was Eichmann was in essence, she used the word, a bland bureaucrat who simply just went along. Now, what most people don't know is the majority of the SS were the Swabian South, Swabian South of Germany. The majority of them were actually Catholic, at least by birth or baptism. And they had gone along with this trash of, in essence, the Hegels and the Nietzsche's and all of the, the, the philosophy rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's how Germany morphed into that. But what I found really most interesting of Hannah Arendt's conclusion is that she found Eichmann a bland bureaucrat who just simply went along with the culture to climb the ladder of advancement. There is where we are in the United States today, and especially in academia, in media, in government. There are people who, and, and I tell you, I've lived in Washington my entire adult life, and you're looking at right now federal employees who are literally the employment elite in the United States. Uh, uh, the federal bureaucrats basically live for one thing and one thing only, to understand their concept. Do you know what that is? Their pensions. Mm -hmm. these, these people talk about their pensions in their early 30s. And they get the equivalent of six weeks off a year. We just got a new holiday. What, what was our new holiday that we just got a, uh, six months ago? What was this one? Uh, ten, ten, two weeks off of holidays, four weeks and then they all take at least a week of sick leave because they get so much accumulated. They're getting 10 weeks off a year paid. Mm. And they're, they're all living off their pension. So don't ever think you're going to see a lot of state, municipal, local employees because government employees live for one thing and one thing only, their pensions. And that's why the heart and soul of the Democratic Party are Democrats because the government just continues to give them everything for their vote, the teachers union, firemen, police. Ted, this is going back many years to your earlier book, Idols in the House, but correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't one of their goals also to break down, I think you described it maybe as like a footstool with the three uh, legs, but was the church and the uh, media and then the uh, academics the teaching and 
they've infiltrated all those really quite successfully in some ways, haven't they? Well, just take a look. Some, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's not so much a footstool, but more or less a, a stool with three legs because uh, it can't stand if one of them are missing. And uh, that's, but they, they've gone after, there's nothing like they've gone after than academia, because if you can get these liberal professors brainwashing the kids really, really young, you'll own them after that. And then what happens, professors at the elite schools, and the better the school academically, at least its reputation is that the professors are the nuttiest. Yeah. I mean, if you want to get brainwashed, send your kid to a, an academic elite school, unless, because by and large, it would take a strong kid to get in there and battle that system. Well, you've got so much great information in this diabolical disorientation. It's available at sign.org. Ted, before we wrap up today's show, how would you like to close it out? And what words of wisdom would you give to the people watching us? Because we are living in precarious times. I'll tell you what, it, it's a question we're asked a lot in the apostolate uh, during the COVID year here. Uh, our apostolate is now 34 years old, and we had our busiest year, literally in the year 2020 to present, to where people are calling in from all around the country. They're buying books, a lot of people, DVDs. Uh, they're listening to these kind of talks that we're doing. Um, but I, 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 I say this. There's anybody who, uh, any businessman, parent, what, whatever it is, athlete, in times of stress, um, stick with the fundamentals. I, I try to use a sports metaphor because people can understand it. I've been following sports since I was a boy. And it, I don't, it doesn't make a difference whether it's an NBA, FIFA World Cup, uh, Super Bowl, uh, World Series, uh, whatever it is, um, the NBA championship, um, it, it, no matter what, they'll, at the end of the year when there's one victor and somebody goes in the, um, the locker room, they'll shove a microphone in, in front of somebody's face and they'll say, they'll say to the captain or, you know, the champagne spraying all over the place, whatever it is, how did you guys get here? What was it? And they say two things consistently since I've been a boy, I hear it time and time again. And it's a spiritual metaphor for us today. And they say this, they say first, you know, as a team, let's say it's hockey. As a team, we just stress the fundamentals. So that's, that applies everywhere. So you can't win with a man in the penalty box because there's about a 40% chance the other team's going to score when you're a man down. So now, you, you, you know, they've just scored on you when you've got a guy sitting in the penalty box. So they said, what we did is we stressed the fundamentals, skate, shoot, pass, don't take stupid penalties, ride the guy out rather than trying to take his head off. So fundamentals. And then the second thing they always say, you know, as a team, we just enjoy each other. Our wives get together. We go to the kids, each other's birthday parties. We like each other. You know, we've just enjoyed each other's company. You know, there's 10 of us going to play St. Andrews and golf courses in Scotland here. When the season ends, we're leaving in three weeks to go, you know, to Scotland to play. So what are they saying? And first point, they're saying it boils down to the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals of our faith? We know what they are. We've got to do them. We simply have to be engaged because there's so much spiritual lethargy or, or laziness. We have to do it. And the second thing is we have to be involved in community. And community is, is that team enjoying each other's company because what happens if somebody else who's maybe not a believer uh, and they see the way that they, that they care for each other that's community is what it is. There's your definition of community. And if you have a family that or, or friends and all you're doing is arguing about faith and there's a non-believer there or a person who's sitting on the fence, 
why would a person want to be a part of that where all they're hearing is bickering? Right. And that's that's the flaw among uh, among uh, Catholics. I'm going to speak more for Catholics because I'm so, but I'm sure it's everywhere. But why do people, do they feel love? Do they feel support? Do they feel encouragement? Do they feel community? That people have to be involved at the local level. The communists that beat back communism like they did in Poland, they realize their strength in numbers in being organized the same way the Alinskys and the Gromskys did get involved with people. So again, fundamentals in community. Get involved. Get now, involved. Ted, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on Mercy Unbound. I hope to have you back soon. People go to sign, sign.org and order the book, Diabolical Disorientation. We're living in troubled times and uh, we turn back to God and the Lord and his church and uh, trust in his mercy. Uh, so again, please uh, watch these shows, share them with your friends and contacts and subscribe. And thank you for joining me today on Mercy Unbound. Thank you, Brian. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash dr. Brian, B-R-Y-A-N Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R. And on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbrianthatcher.com.